situation. Have you ever thought about how you're going to change your next situation? <laughs> Ask your neighbor, say, neighbor, have you thought about how you're going to change your next situation? Here is the situation here, because Jabez means sorrow. Listen to me, you got to get this clearly. Jabez, his name means sorrow. It means pain. It means grief. And his mother gave him the name uh, with this, uh, with this, uh, with this, uh, this, no, this nomenclature with reason, because she says, "I bore him." Verse nine in sorrow. Let me read it to you, the whole verse. And Jabez was more honorable than his brethren and his mother called his name Jabez because I bear him with sorrow. You see, all children are born with sorrow uh, for the sentence of, upon the woman is that in sorrow shall you bring forth children, um, but some with much more sorrow than others. Usually the sorrow in bearing is often uh, afterwards forgotten for the joy of the child that is born takes away that sorrow. It is stated in modern psychology that there's a gap, but gap stop in our remembrance of pain and that, that, that after it is followed by having a great pleasure. Why? Because that great pleasure causes us to forget the pain and then often repeat the cycle to return again to have again great pleasure again. This is why, you know, we look so, hear women all the time after having a child, I will never do that again. And you look up and they're pregnant all over again. The whole deal is, is that God put it in you to lose your your, uh, to temporarily use, lose your memory, uh, not of the experience, uh, but what it costs you. And, you, uh, and, and that cost uh, does not merit uh, the blessing that comes from it. Because of that, it becomes okay to repeat the cycle. But here it is, uh, it was so extraordinary that pain and sorrow was remembered when this child was born. He came to be circumcised and to care for him was a part of the perpetuating and remembrance of pain while he lived. His mother then offers this. This offers room for me having a question for his mother. I'm wondering what Sister Jabez had in her mind. Why would you name your child Sorrow? <clears throat> Why would you call him Sorrow? What if the only name your family and friends could call you by was Sorry? <laughs> Go and look at somebody real quick and say, how you doing, Sorry? How does that make you feel if the only name that you could be called by all your life is sorry? Uh, if, uh, see, uh, when you look at it, how would you integrate uh, and, 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 and engage daily? But this is the real fact. See, understand this about how things happen when we talk about nomenclatures and situations in this area. There's a difference between what they call you and who you are. Somebody here look at your neighbor and say, there's a difference between what they call you and who you are. One of the most liberating things about a name is that it can be changed. Mm -hmm. When you understand this, you'll understand it from what I'm talking about in this context in a minute here. Because if you go back in history, when God decided he was going to choose a man and choose a people, he picked a man named Abram and he changed his name in Genesis 17 and 5 and said, no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. Understand his name change was to change him based upon his purpose in life. And he moved from being called founding father to becoming the father of many nations. That's why he changed the name. He added the last part on his name. Or you can look at Jacob to Israel. How his name, Jacob's name was changed to Israel in Genesis 32. From a trickster is what Jacob means. And now you are my people. Isn't this interesting how God knows how to take you from whatever to make you what you need to be. Or like King Nebuchadnezzar, you know, when he wanted to 
to put the Hebrew boys in some form of deeper bondage in the Babylonian captivity in Daniel 1 and 7. He changed Hananiah's name to Shadrach. He changed Mishael's name to Meshach. And he changed uh, Azariah's name to Abednego because he wanted to lock them in. And as he locked them in, he didn't realize that you can actually change their name and make it mean bondage, but turn up the fire and, that, and what you gave them will burn off. The whole deal is that God knows exactly how to get you to where he's designed your life to be. Let's even go to the New Testament because Saul's name was changed to Paul. Understand, we see that in Acts 13 verses 2 through 9. We saw he's a vessel. As Paul, he's a vessel that's sent. There's a difference between just being a vessel and being a vessel that has some orders attached to you. You understand here, he changed his name based upon what was coming next in his life. Even Jesus, Jesus asked his disciples a simple question. In Matthew 16 and 13, he said, who do men say that I am? Some say you John the Baptist, some say you Elijah. Along the line. And, and then here comes up about Peter, who begins to say it at the end. He says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus answers him in, in Matthew 16 and 17 and says, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, uh, but my father, which is in heaven. And then he says in verse 18, and I say to you, unto you, that thou art Peter. I like it when he said that, because if you parallel that, that, parallel that with Jesus, John 1 and 42. John 1 and 42, the moment he very first met Peter, the first thing he said to Peter, and before he let Peter have a word, he says, thou art Simon, son of Jonas, uh, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is entitled Rock. And it took him getting to the next piece to when he, Jesus asked him the question that he literally tied him to the rock of salvation being himself and pointed to the essence of uh, 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 of uh, what he said his designation would be. So he spoke it and then he made it return and manifest. What a conflicting paradox, par paradox then for j -Pass. Because when we look at j -Pass, being more honorable than his brethren, but with a name that means sorrow, there's a lesson in this. Because uh, understand, he teaches us something about recognizing when people won't respect you for who you're supposed to be. He, Understand that's something you should grab right from the beginning, and Jabez got it real quick. Let me show you a couple of those things. The first thing is, uh, my name was not my choice, but the record of how I live is my life is my choice. My name does not measure up to, if it doesn't measure up to who God says I am in the spirit, then I need to make sure my life measures up <laughs> to who God says I am. Being honorable is essential and necessary, even when it's not popular. And so he puts this in a great posture because we have to ask the question, why then did his mom name him this way? This is why you got to be so careful naming everybody, you know, Bukisha and all those names, you know, all, this, all this stuff. <laughs> You know, all these names, you, know, you don't know what they mean. You're just calling your kid something along the line. You, you might be calling them the devil or whatever. You don't even, you got to make, be careful. Search out, look at your name, say search out a name. Search out a name. Yeah, search out the name. Need to know what you're calling. And so when we looked at why his mom named him this way, there are four reasons that literally show up. The first one is, is that it might be a continual mem uh, 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 memorandum to her to be thankful to God for as long as she lived, for supporting her under and bringing her through specific sorrow. So maybe the first reason she did it, because she was looking at the essence here, that, listen, I thank God for, uh, for bringing me through my sorrow. But maybe the second reason here may make sense too that maybe his mom named him this because it might likewise be a memorandum not to her but to him that this world that you're living in is going to bring you a whole lot of tears. You're going to experience some sorrow and understand that a man uh, that in this life is born of a few days and they are full of trouble. And so maybe he, she was letting him know that you're not going to get away without going through some stuff. Talk to somebody. Tell them you're not going to get away <laughs> without going through some stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so now there's two reasons, but then maybe it's a third reason here. Maybe to my, uh, maybe he, uh, 
uh, he carried this name because it might help put some seriousness in his spirit when he regarded how he would pursue his own future. That listen here, you're, going, you're not going to have a testimony until you put a marker up and be able to see where you came from and take a look at where you are and be able to measure the difference between and say, listen here, that's where I used to be. This is where I am now. And so I thank God because I'm not what they say I am. I'm who he says I am. Can anybody be glad about the fact that God has made you who he says you are? Because you, everybody here can look and see somebody who counted you out at some point in your life. You can look at somebody who told you what you could not do. There's certain things that would not happen, but look at you now. Go look at them in the face. Go and say, look at you now. Look at you. God knows how to bless you through your circumstance and give you everything that you're supposed to have. And maybe the fourth reason might be to remind them of the love and the honor of his mother for her labor in everything, that she went through sorrow to be a comfort to her. Don't forget mama who brought you through everything. It could have been any of these four reasons. What is incredible with beginning in sorrow is the ending result. It's the fact that the scripture says that he was more honorable than his brethren. And so she has some other kids, but the Bible doesn't say that she named any of them sorrow or sorry. She named him that, and he ends up being more honorable than the other ones. This qualified him above them by divine grace and by dignifying him above them by divine providence. Whatever they did virtuously, he excelled above them all. Now that the sorrow which, uh, with which his mother bore him was abundantly paid back with the blessing, the son of all her children that cost her the most end up being the one she's most happy in. This then shifts the, the dynamic and makes us understand. Now some of you are children in a family and it looks like you were ignored, but at the end of the day, you end up being the one they call on. God knows exactly how to set you up. You know, he knows how to make who you are mag become magnified at the right time. Yet in his sorrow, Jabez was imminent, outstanding. He was noticeable. He was publicly lifted up. He was superior in achievement. He wanted to be on top. Ask your neighbor, do you like being on top of the situation? Yeah. So even though he had a name that means sorrow, he could not stand being at the bottom of the, of the pile. He always worked his way to the top here. He teaches us that to embrace uh, the good news that is ours. Uh, we need at some point to let the bad news go. Uh, look at somebody said, let the bad news go. He was born in sorrow, but decided that he would not be a sorry person. And look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you too blessed to act sorry. Tell me, you too, you too blessed to whine all the time, complain all the time. Come on, tell me, you too blessed to act like God's not making things work out for your good. Something about you should, when you wake up saying, thank you, Jesus for another day because you've been so good to me. My God, I'm going to tell somebody pitiful doesn't look good on you. Go on, tell them. <laughs> Understand, uh, when God is for you, they can't hold you down. Come on, tell, some, tell your neighbor, they can't hold you down. And so when you understand what pitiful is, you'll recognize that pitiful only happens when you will not let go of the things that you cannot change so that you might embrace the things that you can change. Understand that you only remain pitiful when you keep laying in the same stuff over and over again and will not get up and do something about it when availability is there. Pitiful is when God is blessing you, but you're whining about what you don't like when you got so much that you need right in front of you. you you gotta pick which one you're gonna pay attention to. It makes more sense to glorify God about what He's doing in your life than to whine about the one or two things that have not gone your way yet. I hope y'all hearing what I'm talking about. At some point, you gotta shift it up because understand here, all of this means that if you remain pitiful, that you are harboring illegal attachments. Look at your neighbor and say, harboring illegal attachments. And you don't want the police of the Spirit 
spirit to pick you up for hanging around and harboring criminals to the existence of your future by not setting yourself up to be able to step into what God has ordained for you. I mean here, uh, some of us are deli deliberately live off of the illegal attachments and superficial ties. We got to make up in our mind, I want more than this. Somebody ought to holler, I want more than this. Some of us deliberately, when we live off this way, we have to get to the position where we start asking the question, how do I get the best out of my relationships? Somebody here, just go ahead and ask your neighbor, say, neighbor, how do I get the best?